Hello and welcome. This is the Fit for Privacy podcast, the podcast for professionals. I am your host Punit Bhatia. In this podcast, we talk to influencers so that you get to listen and learn from their experiences and thoughts. Remember, this is not legal advice and if you need one, please contact a professional with your situation. So let's get started. Hello and welcome. Today in the Fit for Privacy podcast, we have a unique special guest, Alan Woods. Welcome to the show, Alan. Hi, yeah, and welcome. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's an honor. Thanks, Alan, for being here. For our audiences, Alan is a technologist. He's a privacy enthusiast. He's a retired person, and he has also been in military. And I don't know what all you have done, Alan. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, um, I've got a profile on LinkedIn if anyone wants to look. But basically, um, I left school when I was about 17, uh, joined the British Army. Um, I trained in a uh, specifically military skill and spent the first 15 years of my Army career with uh, frontline operational units. Um, at around about the 15-year point, I decided to retrain in something um, there's a whole pile of reasons behind that, which I won't go into, and it just happened to be computing. And it was the probably uh, a sensible time to do it, in that there were changes, PCs were beginning to proliferate and so on and so forth across defence. Um, I studied through to degree level, uh, just in time to finish my military career, and then subsequently went on academically to become a chartered engineer from, uh, with the British Computer Society. Um, I also, uh, from around about 1983, 84 on, uh, worked in military IT up until two years ago. Hmm. And that's uh, basically uh, a year before I retired. Um, and in that time, I did, over that time, I did all kinds of things. Um, I, it, it's in the profile, but uh, basically uh, everything you can possibly imagine, I guess, um, from uh, coding to carrying out forensic reviews of licensing terms, all kinds of things. Um, I was lucky, I think is the best way to describe it, <laughs> rather than anything else, um, because some of the things I did, I just wouldn't be allowed to do now. And much mm. of my work was to do with compliance, um, and in particular, the movement of hazardous materials. Mm. Um, and I built the original MOD uh, health and safety information system. Um, my last job was what the military call a, an independent qualification body on the transformation program, IT transformation program for the Royal Air Force Voyager uh, hmm. program. And the, the Voyager, if you look it up, is basically the air tankers. And that kind of um, it was to go out with a blast, I think, is the best way to describe it. <laughs> um, it was quite an interesting job all by itself because it, too, was about compliance largely. And uh, it came as uh, a, the level of compliance issues to do with aircraft was an eye-opener. Mm -hmm. um, everything from the Civil Aviation Authority to... Uh, the U.S. State Department was involved one way or another, um, and it, it just was a whole raft of things were covered in the job. And now I'm an old geezer, sat around, poodling. Interesting. So risk, danger, compliance, that's something which you have always been around. Yep. And mostly I didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> and how did you then end up in privacy? Oh, well, that was down to, um, I, I sort of stumbled across about two or three years before the uh, it became law of a copy of the GDPR. Mm -hmm. I read it um, and got to Article 17. And when I got to it, my jaw dropped. There's no other way to describe it. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the jaw drop was, uh, as you know, 17 is about the right for deletion. <laughs> Um, I was looking at it and thinking, God, nobody's going to be able to do this. No. Um, or at least those that can are going to be spending a lot of money on it. 
Yeah. I then went back and read it very, very carefully several times. And by carefully, I mean forensically. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, I built a uh, legislation librarian because I wanted to be able to search content um, depending on phrases and bits and pieces that came along. And uh, since then, what I've been doing via LinkedIn is pretty much every week trying to publish something to do with information management as opposed to the regulation per se um, to explain some of the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one was to try and, uh, and we'll probably come on to this, try and emulate the kind of things that Amazon get up to as a result of a recent BBC Panorama documentary on that company. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, I find it fascinating, but I also find it um, extremely complex in information management terms. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and from what I know, you are doing all this as a volunteer effort, voluntary yeah. effort. Uh, it, it's a matter of, for me of this. Um, everything I do is to try and help, uh, the particularly small businesses, because for most of my working life after leaving the army, I was a small businessman. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, that small business in particular takes a lot of courage to set yeah. up, and you will know that. Um, <laughs> it is a matter of, uh, the increasingly changing legislative environment means that, uh, and the GDPR is unique because it is uniquely complex technologically, yeah. means that people need help. Absolutely. Um, and that's what I've been trying to do for good or ill. No, but we all try to do our part. It's new, it's challenging, but maybe that, let me ask you, Yes, GDPR is complex. Yes, it's challenging. But what is one word you would use to describe GDPR? Flawed. Sorry? Flawed. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is this. Uh, when I got to 17, um, and when I started reading it, there were massive changes in the way that IT works architecturally. Yeah. Um, and you could see that the document was written in such a way that it followed classic linear and procedural methods of doing data capture. Yeah. Well, in between then and now, the change has been fundamental. It's more akin to uh, multiple forms of conversation right. and multiple forms of interac interaction in near real time. And it just wasn't like that even a few years ago. And you can see that now with things like Zoom, um, which is quite topical at the moment. Um, the use of uh, various forms of email, websites in particular, and all the rest. It's all changed out of all proportion. Um, and uh, that's why I say it's flawed, because I don't think it's geared properly, certainly from a technical perspective, to cover all of the changes that it's mm. got to cover. Interesting. So what's your concern around GDPR? Or what's your concern that about GDPR when you say it's flawed? Um, Principally, it is that uh, at the, there are far too many involved in it, uh, and I mean across the piece, mm -hmm. who don't know how IT works. And by that I mean coding. Uh, it, it is a matter to design a database and all the rest of it, because underpinning all of these things is code, our databases for just about everything now. And if you take the average website as a case in point, mm -hmm. um, almost all of them call code from locations other than the hosting server. Yeah. And what that means then is at the point of page rendering, for example, control of page rendering is passed to another machine for however long it takes, it's usually only nanoseconds. But nevertheless, that control is quite powerful in terms of what people can do with it one way or the other. So there's a lot going on uh, that uh, I just don't think, it, it, there's just so much going on, so much has changed in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think uh, privacy is in itself a challenge, but then the challenge is also around if you need to understand it, you need to understand IT, you need to know a bit, uh, a lot of legal, you need to understand the terms of business, you need to know compliance, you need to know ethics. So there's no one size fits all, rather it's a 
it's a challenge to have all those skills in one person and that's where it becomes challenging but yes. what you are saying is that everyone and i think you are hinting towards that the privacy officers privacy managers and the dpos should have the capability to understand databases and codes so a little bit of technical knowledge that's what you're getting to yes um if you one of the things i did when i built my librarian they also did a small case study to try and position the dpo as a role mm -hmm. now i'm not going to go into the specific act, uh, acts i can pull them down if you like in a few seconds but that's by the by we all know them um the thing about the DPO is, it, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's an assurance role. Yes, it is. It, it is not hands-on. Um, and it's if you are obliged to have a DPO, the nature of the role is a statutory requirement rather than, okay, let's let's think about it and all the rest. So the role is clearly defined in, in the GDPR. Um, that said, uh, because it is an assurance role, it is observational. Yeah. And advisory. So it's it's it has no real authority in the sense that it's not part of the management chain. Yeah. Okay. But now, I, go on. Yeah, yeah. No, I share your view. I think uh, that's the very reason that it's an observatory role. So to make those observations, to make those advices, you need to be able to understand and communicate with variety of people who are specialists in different fields. Yes. Um, and at the moment, originally, uh, sort of over the, when it kicked off, there were two bunches of people that sort of seemed to take control or yeah. take the lead. And the legal fraternity and InfoSec. Yeah. And I'm afraid uh, I, I, InfoSec, this is not about information security per se. It is about fairly sophisticated data management. And at the moment, that I think is a significant um, knowledge gap. Um, amongst other things, the GDPR requires uh, or sets out the need for an accreditation body, but it still hasn't got one worth the candle officially recognized anywhere. Yeah, and what that yet. means is that anybody really can set themselves up as writing GDPR compliant code and all the rest of it, but they're just not doing it. No, so not yet. No. So it's a matter of, um, it is multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't do the job for all the tea in China. <laughs> all these ways, if it did, I'd be the DPO from hell. Um, it, it, it requires the kind of information management control that most organizations, most small companies definitely just can't afford. Yeah. And that puts them in a position where they have a regulation that they cannot comply with because, first of all, they don't know how, and secondly, they probably can't afford it. Yeah, I think it's both uh, affordability, understanding, mm -hmm. and a lot of other factors, and also will, because their priority is towards earning money while this is expenditure, and they are not able to justify this expenditure as something that helps them earn the money. Absolutely. And that, to my mind, makes it um, unfair. It also leaves out the idea of personal responsibility and liability, and I'm all for that. Um, what tends to happen is in IT, geeks are the one bunch of people who can create mayhem and then just walk away as if nothing has happened, and that happens too frequently. So you want somebody in IT also to be made responsible just like the DPOs are? Yes. Um, okay, that's interesting. I mean, that would be stretching the DPO remit uh, a little bit more into the technology side. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you see is missing on yes, the GDPR. Interesting. But coming back to the topic which you raised earlier, the data deletion, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. that when you read that article, you were thinking of, oh, how how is it going to happen? And that's also a practical challenge which most of us have or most of us here, even in privacy field. For those who understand technology, we do understand the technology or the systems or the databases have been built to keep data rather than to delete data I mean, for those who have seen the uh, gone technology or seen the technology in the last 20 years or so they know there was used to be something called relational databases that means there are relations there are connections between different data and if it's like a bicycle you can't have one falling without the other one falling and 
since those relational databases are so interconnected, so interwoven, nobody knows if I delete this, what happens across in my databases. That's and that's right. the biggest challenge. So how do you think the data deletion is practical in a modern world? I mean, that's a big I, challenge I, for people. I don't think it is uh, 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 doable anymore, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, not in the way that I would like it. Um, uh, coming back to, uh, there's two things I've, I've put together. Uh, one is a, uh, a web page that explains what browser fingerprinting about is about. Yeah. And another was a study of a uh, web page, just a single web page in a website over three days. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, have you, uh, if you've read Zuboff and Surveillance Capitalism, mm -hmm. one of the exercises she mentions in it is a thermostat device. And she set some students on it to track how many different locations that one thermostat device passed data to. Mm -hmm. um, they gave up after a thousand. Hmm. Um, and you can see that with the average website. Um, if people know how to look at a uh, web page using the uh, web browser debugging tools, then typically you'll find that in the vast majority of web pages, there are add ons called from other places. Yeah. Now, each of them has license terms, each of them has terms of use on top of licensing terms. And the purpose of them is to reduce the developers' liabilities and responsibilities, but increase them for those of the end user or the, rather the, the site owner. Yeah. Now, if you, if you take the more popular, what that means then is this. They are collecting data, uh, uh, feeding it into the dataverse or the, the, data, the, 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 the data lake or whatever you want to use of the people who own the source code and then to all intents and purposes it disappears. Now paradoxically the uh, idea of a controller in uh, the GDPR is that the controller has the means to control yep. on a full end-to-end -end across the arc or whatever basis. Right. And that's just simply not possible. No, not in the modern world as you explained the data keeps flowing from one entity to the other seamlessly especially when a small or mid-sized company or one person is creating a website yes and you also have multiple forms of processing and multiple forms of data and mm -hmm. they, they're each different so stuff that nominally goes into a database mm -hmm. in principle is easy to delete because all you do is maintain the referential integrity write the necessary delete rules and in principle delete the code mm -hmm. delete the, the data however um, the GDPR is not primus inter pares in terms of the law. Mm -hmm. It is just part of a legal framework. Yeah. And there are other reasons why you would have, you may have to uh, maintain data or keep data. Right. So financial reporting, for instance, under IFRS, which is another tale of Mr. and Imagination when you start <laughs> to read it. Um, and then you've got documents. Right. Now, document files may contain names. Um, and that means a uh, you should really go through document files as well as data when you are responding to a request. But that requires two forms of reading to be carried out. The first forensic, in other words, to find the nature of the uh, a name, say. Yeah. And the second being to review the document such that you do not alter its structure and purpose. Absolutely. So if, so if you change the name in a contract, um, and the name, uh, the name is one of many signatories. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's probably something written in it to say that one person drops out, we've got to reissue the contract, that kind of thing. <laughs> so it's got more complicated. It's not just a matter of looking at a database, delete someone and then move on. It, it, it needs careful study and careful architectural control. Yeah, I think deletion nowadays is getting into two dimensions the data, deletion of the structured data so data that's in databases systems and then the unstructured data that's in files that's in sharepoints that's in notepads and that's also in physical form that's also the third category then the physical yeah. data and um, i've just actually commented on something on uh, about zoom mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that it struck me about like a couple of hours ago is that that has added another form of data that just wasn't 
as common as it's about to be, and that True. is the nature of video and what's contained in that. Yeah. Now again, that it just gives another form of uh, complexity to the management control of data generally than was the case even 18 months ago. Absolutely, and I think we are getting into a new paradigm wherein we will also have to have a policy around what to do with meeting recordings because with Zoom, <laughs> with teleconferences and so on, you will end up recording them in certain cases. Yeah. And then what do we do with that? Because, okay, in this conversation we are recording it, it's with consent and it's for good intentions to help people. But in a, other domains, when you're talking about personal data and making decisions about companies, then it has totally different consequence and it's a new world that's opening up. Yeah, if I uh, divert a second, there was uh, there's something on LinkedIn called the nightmare letter. Yes, there was. Yes, I'm a big fan of that because <laughs> of the pur its purpose. Right. Its purpose, uh, you could use it as a template if you like, but I wouldn't. Um, it, its purpose was as a test platform to test right. your, re your reaction to an SAR or a, 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 an Article 17 request. Yeah. And for that, I think it's just brilliant. Absolutely. It, it, because what it does is, I reckon a minimum of three runs. The first one to prove that you can't do it. Yeah. The second one to come back after everyone's got over the panic and then um, present a possible solution and then find that that can't do it either. And re then rinse and repeat until you can. And what that will do is demonstrate the complexity. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, it... Uh, uh, just the nature of managing documents is a big elephant in the data protection room. Yeah, I think the nightmare letter was quite useful, at least in some of the organizations I worked in, mm -hmm. in terms of testing out how ready you are in terms of compliance or what people are reacting to in different uh, parts of the organization That's when it, they exactly. receive it. And I think it needs to be rewritten in view of the current circumstances. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of that thing. <laughs> so maybe we sh uh, you, you can, as part of your voluntary service, write a new nightmare letter and publish on LinkedIn. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. No. I know my limitations. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you talked about the issues that are relating websites and issues uh, relating the dig uh, data deletion, especially in the digital world. So what would you recommend or advise to young companies or young people or even uh, the DPOs in large companies when they are designing or looking into designs of websites or at least approving that? So what are the key things they should take care of? Okay. Um, I would, first of all, assuming it is just a website, mm -hmm. um, because Typically, what a website does is, is takes you beyond your organization boundary very quickly. Right. In fact, instantaneously. Now, it means that the, to understand the role of the controller means that you are responsible for the, well, just everything to do with the website, really. Um, and that's everything from security right the way through. Um, I would expect if you were, if I were to commission a website, this is what I would do if I wasn't going to write it myself. Mm -hmm. I would go to a professional body, mm -hmm. whichever you like, mm -hmm. uh, seek a properly qualified person from whatever list they have. They all do. Uh, the organization, the bodies I was in was, was, was were part of it. And the reason for doing that is you will probably, hopefully, end up with somebody who is technically competent and recognized as such. Yeah. I would expect them to come rock up increasingly with stuff like professional indemnity insurance, okay, to cover, um, because basically one of the more curious things about IT is, is particularly coders, is um, there seems to be a remarkable acceptance of failure. Yeah. Um, in other words, geeks can do things wrong and they'll get away with it. <laughs> Um, that wouldn't happen with in the medical profession. It wouldn't happen in the engineering professions or anything like that. And to my mind, it's exactly the same. I would expect them to be able to demonstrate and test and prove their code, both server side and client side. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is 
code that is written is generally not the same as code that is delivered client side. That's another issue, yeah. Um, I mean, if I quote an example, you can call, there's a very popular library called jQuery. Mm -hmm. You can call that in a web page with one line and then use add-ons and other bits and pieces. But that single one line call drops 10,000 lines of code client side in a client yes. order. I would expect them to demonstrate technical competence in the nature of the code that they are dropping client side. In other words, if they're going to use a library or a component, they know precisely what it does and they can demonstrate and explain in detail what it does. Um, and that's the most important things at the minute. Um, it, the la nature of the language doesn't matter because in, uh, in software writing, there are multiple ways to skin a cat. And mm -hmm. as a consequence, there is only what works. Yeah. Um, it is that kind of thing. Uh, because basically, when you commission a website, uh, and if you like later on, I'll take you through one of the major legal websites and show you something <laughs> like that will blow your mind away. Um, the nature of quality control in terms of the integrity and robustness of code seems to be lacking. Yeah. And you can see that in a heartbeat. So essentially, because some of our audiences may not be technical enough, as you all rightly said, uh, DPOs need to understand or privacy officers need to understand technology a bit more. But let's simplify for sake of those who are not so techy tech savvy, let's say. Uh, what we are saying is, one, assume your responsibility as a controller and take ownership of what data flows in. And one of the ways of doing it is when a website is being designed, a lot of libraries or things are being pulled in. You mentioned one uh, that being jQuery and they drop in numerous amounts of code or information which gets pulled in and pulled out without the knowledge of the person or the company using yes. the website. And that's something to be aware of and asking a question around who is this data getting shared with? Have you tested out what data goes in and out? And if those libraries or those external interfaces are certified in terms of information and security protection, uh, protection of their data. Yeah, and, and just to add a bit more to that, um, what there are a couple of legal cases mm -hmm. um, or judgments from the ECJ in particular, Fashion ID and Planet 49. Right. Um, one of which establishes the idea of joint control. Yeah. Um, the other one goes into cookies, which I think we're going to talk about later. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's also the idea of the nature of liability and business risk that's going with this stuff if it all goes wrong. So yeah. cannot, it, it's becoming increasingly uh, risky to just say, yeah, it's a website and yeah, okay, it doesn't matter because it's actually a very complicated bit of software. Yeah, and I think it is getting more and more complicated because everybody wants to have Google Analytics on it. Everybody <laughs> wants to have uh, Facebook pixels on it, tracking codes on it. And as you have that, then what it becomes is Maybe at the time you are approving the website or doing the due diligence or DPIA, uh, there was no personal data being collected. But in a Google Analytics, it's a matter of just changing some parameters afterwards, and a lot of personal data may be collected. Yes, it, there's not not may be collected. It is being collected. <laughs> that, that's not open to discussion, and it's perfectly provable. Even if no, I was said, trying to be politically correct. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. It, it is being collected. Um, the other thing is that I, 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 I ask people to try and consider is this. Um, there is sound commercial reasons for doing this privacy game. Right. And one of them is this, and a, a, a plea. Uh, if people look up the term header bidding mm -hmm. and see just how much, how sophisticated that is in terms of uh, how to spend your advertising dollars. Right. It, it goes something like this. Uh, you put a component from one of the major players on a website, mm -hmm. then what you are doing is collecting data by proxy for them. Yeah. You pass that data into their world, which you lose track of. And I dare say they do. It's, it's just they've got so much. Yeah. What happens then is something like this. Um, 
the data that is passed into them and how they generate their revenue is through targeted advertising. Yeah, but Not that's the core business of uh, any marketing, social media, advertising yes. company. Yes, but it's not necessarily about targeting person. It's targeting people by social economic group and that kind of thing, whatever they may be. Yeah. Now, what happens then is it's a bid process. And the people who can pay the most money are normally the people who are the biggest companies. Right. So as a consequence, you passing your data, your company data into one of these things... Yeah. You are raising the bid price that the, the, the uh, data owners, the data operators can, can call on. And that usually means your major competitor will buy you, will, will pay more than you can and you can't advertise anyway. No. So it, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, essentially what we are talking about is the boundaries are blurring around who is owning the data and where who owns which part of the data. And that's the whole complexity with the modern world. And you use two terms consistently saying what's on the server side and what's on the client side. Maybe for those of us who are not aware of it, would you take a moment to describe what you mean by client side and server side? Okay, um, let's, let's, let's vary that a little bit. There are a variety of ways of writing code. Yes. A variety of ways of writing code in, uh, and where it executes. And the nature of code op executed server side tends to not be delivered client side in as much as it is executed. And so let's say you, you have a, a web page that calls it, uh, calls it files a, a query in a database. That's normally done server side. And what happens is the data is transmitted so you can put stuff on a page. The, the, the page rendering is typically entirely client-side, and that's the drawing of it, the putting words on and all that kind of stuff. But what can also happen is there are a variety of techniques under the general term AJAX, which can be used to transmit uh, data from a page without any kind of uh, notification of end users. Um, AJAX is one of the means by which Magecart, a famous, uh, or rather infamous, ran, uh, hacking attack goes on, and that costs British Airways a shed load of money. But it's right. that kind of thing that can go on. So you have different, it's just basically different kinds of coding techniques applied at different stages in page, render, in page rendering before page rendering happens. Now, this, what the, the, the thing I would ask people to consider is this. When you log on to a computer, enter the password and all the rest or your fingerprint or whatever it is, what you do is you establish your bona fides with the computer to go out into the world. Yeah. Now, what tends to happen nowadays with increasing regularity is people will immediately go on the web. So what they've done is they've validated themselves as a user. They then go on the web and they give access to server-side and uh, internal AJAX code and all the rest by virtue of the fact of loading a web page, unless you know what to look for. Yeah. So what's happening is uh, this kind of stuff, um, cross-domain scripting, I guess, is as good a term as any to use, mm -hmm. is basically bypassing much of the things like firewalls and ever, all, all that kind of stuff for no other reason than someone's validated themselves. Yeah. So, uh, the average web page is quite complicated. An awful lot of things going on. Yeah. So essentially, there are two levels at which processing of a website or especially in apps is happening. One is take an example of a phone or a device that data or information is processed at phone level. Yeah. Info and information stays there. But sometimes it's at the level of the company, let's say Apple compute, Apple servers or Google servers, and then yep. it go the data is going there and getting processed there. So if it's client side or server side, it has different advantages and different risks associated with it. Yes, uh, one of the things that people have are obliged to do is to program defensively. Yeah, um, and there are components built into client-side browsers that give you the means to detect the capability of a device. Right. So for instance, location, which is one people are aware of. Yeah. Um, but 
if you program defensively, then what you can do is check that uh, whether or not a capability is active, yeah, and then uh, either operate code to take advantage of that capability, or write wrappers to the code such that you don't take advantage. Yeah. Now, one of the things I suggest people do is this, um, and I'm not having a go at anyone in particular. Mm -hmm. um, on the nature of capability, is if you have a mobile phone and you yeah. have a Facebook app on it, mm -hmm. yeah, switch on your mobile phone, connect up to Facebook through the app, give it a couple of seconds to settle down, and then shake the phone. Hmm. What happens then is, if it's an Apple phone, I've got one here, an Apple phone or, or an Android device, mm -hmm. a bit of Facebook code will flash up a message to the effect of, hey, are you okay? You sound like you're, in, in, you're having a bit of trouble. In mm. other words, if you shake it, it's detecting the movement of the phone or the rapid movement of the phone. Yeah. Now, all in, in and of itself, it's, it's sort of relatively uh, beneficent in as much as it implies that they're trying to take you to help you out. Yeah. But what it's actually doing is demonstrating the nature of the capability of the device to detect movement. Right. And it's that kind of thing that these the, the, the phones in particular have nowadays in space. Um, and there is another thing that uh, I would ask people to consider, and that is the idea of Bluetooth and Bluetooth beacons. Hmm. Um, Bluetooth beacons will be appearing on a high street near you soon in their thousands. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that because your phone, if it's got Bluetooth enabled, just going near to one of these things um, gives your location because they can transmit independently. And what you end up with is a very sophisticated triangula triangulation mechanism of where you are. And there's all kinds of things that go on with that, but basically and in a nutshell and simplistically, that's what's going on. Yeah, it go, it's a complicated world. A lot of information is getting tracked. A lot of data is getting tracked. but. That also sets us for the other question which you said about cookies. That's <laughs> another thing which is supposed to be a simple text file which would store basic information so that you can render the website next time, provide the website next time in a more user-friendly way. But it is taking up completely different perspective and in function of e-privacy regulation that's due and GDPR and uh, any other privacy law. It has a completely different meaning. So what do you observe as a technologist in this space? Um, I have nothing. I just think they're intellectually idle as, as means of, of uh, uh, coding. There is absolutely no need to use cookies, none whatsoever. Um, on my website, for instance, I, I've one of the things I've built is a for our browser fingerprinting page. Um, it does not use cookies, but it will give you the details of a browser fingerprint. Most of it, not all. Mm -hmm. Now, none of my website only uses one cookie in the whole thing, and that's a specific type of cookie, and that's got to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but there just isn't any need for them. Um, they just What they do is they generate a compliance problem that shouldn't really need to be there. Um, if you look at, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. if, you are, if you are passing data inadvertently into Google and millions of people are passing data into inadvertently into Google, yeah. when the data get, hits the servers, there is a totally different kind of processing going on there and they don't need the cookies anyway. No. So what they do is cross-reference <clears throat> one page visit and one device and what have you with your user profile. It's what they do. It's relatively straightforward. Um, yeah. But they don't, they don't really need the cookies. None of them do. Well, uh, that's an interesting argument because when we talk to the technologists who are designing websites and web pages and so on, for them, cookies are a must-have thing. So how, how do we correlate the two? Uh, they just stop dropping cookies. And all they're doing, I, it, 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 there's no. I, I just find the whole thing bizarre. Um, so, for instance, um, 
on the browser fingerprint I have put up, there isn't a database on it, but all it, it's relatively straightforward to devise a data structure to record every time somebody comes, mm -hmm. pretty much everything to do with the browser and whatever the device has. You just don't need them. Um, there is an argument that they can be used for eye candy and what have you, but I just don't see the point. Because all that's happening, let's take the e-privacy directive in its current form. Um, to my mind, it's a far more powerful document than the GDPR. Mm. Um, page 3, para 24, mm -hmm. which is some, the, one of the few quotes I can tell you off the top of my head, mm -hmm. makes reference to something called the sphere of privacy of the end user. Yeah. And what it also says is that nothing should be dropped client side without permission of the end user. Right. Now, I've had that one paragraph checked out by a variety of people who are <laughs> into security in a big way, and every single one of them has been horrified with what it actually means when they think it through. Right. Because what it means is that no content of any kind should hit a user machine without user permission. Yeah, essentially that's what it means. Yes. Now, again, it's it's just not feasible. Uh, you just can't do it. You'd end up having to the pages and databases and all that would just run so incredibly slowly. It's not real. But nevertheless, it's there. Yeah, it's just like the deletion aspect. If you interpret the word delete, which in terms means like in the old days, you have to tear off the paper and destroy all evidence. But in the modern world, delete has different connotations. Yes. Yes, that's it exactly, but it's still a very powerful uh, document, technologically speaking, um, the Privacy Def De Directive, right. simply because it is geared towards people like me. Yeah. And as, and as far as I'm concerned, dropping cookies is just daft. Yeah, and that, if you allow me, leads us all to another dimension of uh, thing. Cookies are in different browsers. And the browsers also play differently <laughs> in different contexts apart from the cookies. So yes. how do you see or have you done any view uh, research around different browsers and how they collect personal data or do you have any view around that? They all do it differently. Of course. Uh, but... Certainly cookies. <laughs> um, what I did was uh, experimented with Tor um, in respect of how it handles um, user data and user insertion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's several myths around Tor as far as I'm concerned about the way it operates. Yeah. Um, because eventually what happens is everything has to end up in a user browser. Yeah. There's, there's no getting away from it. And the kind of experiments I did um, indicated that Tor behaved in pretty much the same way as every other browser, in as much as it gave you more control, so you could lock off all of the capabilities and what have you, or many of the capabilities. But nevertheless, eventually, everything ends up in a client-side machine. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means then is when the page is delivered, it still has the means to transmit uh, much of the data. There are things that are changed and things that are, that are made ambiguous, mm -hmm. so there is an advantage to it. But they all do the same thing. Now, when it comes to your cookies, um, many moons ago now, it used to be the case where a cookie would be dropped in a specific place in a folder on a machine. Mm -hmm. Now they're not. They form part of a database, and each browser stores its cookies in a different place in a different database. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, let's say you run Chrome one day and... Um, uh, edge uh, yeah. next, then the cookies will still be dropped, but will be in different places. Right. So, to all intents and purposes, the average user won't know how to get rid of the things anyway, <laughs> unless they clear the history. Right. So that's all part of the discipline. Um, but to my mind, again, it's far simpler not to use the things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It'll, I don't think it'll be very popular with the technologists <laughs> saying that uh, don't use their cookies, but I'm pretty sure if uh, some of our privacy colleagues listen to it, they will certainly ask that question next time. Well, okay, put it in the nature of risk and liability then, legal risk and liability. If you use them, you are dropping stuff on a client machine. 
Right, you are. That's self-evident. If you are the controller, then you are responsible for pushing the putting that stuff on the machine. Mm -hmm. If you use a typical cookie banner, which appears on the first page of a website, mm -hmm. typically, and then you drop Google Analytics, say, on every single page, then actually your cookie banner on the home page is not going to do anything at all for the other pages. Unless you can write a wrap around every single instance of Google Analytics. So it, it just gets a little bit more complicated than let's just drop a little file on a thing. It's actually architectural, which is where the complications come. Yeah. And if you don't need to use the things, then why use them? It just makes the it makes the websites more complicated. And as much as if you want to track each visitor, then you need to track other stuff besides. Um, but most of it's been is there to to track anyway. So an IP address. Um, yeah. When the GDPR first came out, there was lots of grief about an IP address. <laughs> um, but an IP address is pretty much mandatory because what it's the means by which two computers identify each other across the web. So you can't get rid of that. So that's being sent and transmitted and received no matter what happens. Yeah. There's other stuff too, if you know how to look for it, how you know how to gather it. True. And that is part of the problem. Uh, people are using cookies far too casually. Yes, but it's a, a little bit more than a little bit complicated. As you say, it's a little bit complicated. It's much more complicated than little. <laughs> but anyhow, there's also, when we talk to people, there's a perception or there's a, a kind of a reality also that the big players, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks of this world, they have all the data that they needed because technology generally leads and the laws generally lag. So what has happened in that duration is they have collected all that data, they've collected all the means, and they have the power to have the data. And sometimes people say, well, now it's a bit too late to take care of privacy. So now privacy it, is dead or the privacy, there's no more any privacy. I, I, How I do come, you see that? I come back to the idea of personal responsibility and liability. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact of the matter is that if you, you know, the way that the, the majors structure the legal protection, um, in the Zuboff book, Surveillance Capitalism, she refers to, a, she quotes an American lawyer who said the terms are sadistic. Mm -hmm. um, but what is happening is if you look at the terms and conditions, which nobody reads, no. you look at licensing terms, which nobody reads, yes. which is probably what they depend on anyway. Right. You then look at the law, and they're, like, as I said earlier on, their licensing and TNCs are about reducing their responsibility and liability. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes a matter then is you have to look at it that way mm -hmm. because they are taking data and then using it for whatever means. But what right. I think you also have to do is understand what they're doing with the data. So, for instance, um, the BBC Panorama documentary that had me made me sit bolt upright mm -hmm. um, because there were a number of quotes, one from Jeff Bezos, um, in which they said the Bezos quote in particular goes something like this. Um, you may be a, a man who buys a shirt. And the shirt is, say, $20 and I make a dollar's profit out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in that one dollar. What I want is a couple of hundred thousand men buying similar shirts so I can yep. find out which one is the best. Right. And then tell the rest of them, this one's the best. This is really cool. And that's pretty much what they do. So, again, they're not interested in first person singular too much, except in various stages, key stages in the transaction process. What they want, and it's not just Amazon and the Gath, the supermarkets do the same thing. Yeah. What they want is the huge volumes of data, which they apply sophisticated analysis to, to find out what the chances are that lots of people will like a particular good or service. Right. And that's entirely different to the way most people see stuff. So essentially what you're saying is the big players are interested in the big data that combine the aggregated data because that's where they see the value when they combine everything, when they aggregate everything together. 
Yes. Um, I mean, so essentially, it is a challenge for the smaller players around how do they manage compliance because the big players also have big money to take care of compliance, while the smaller players have less money, less means, and less resources even to get advice. It, it comes back to having a plan to the way you're going to do this. And again, the idea that there are sound commercial reasons for doing privacy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm of the view now where handing over any data is slow motion commercial suicide. <laughs> uh, it, it just is. Um, it, it is a matter of this. If you're, it's like anything, caveat emptor rules. Um, if you set off to do something, make sure you understand what's going on. And let's take, again, coming back to uh, Amazon, not to have a go at them, because I think what they've done is very clever. Mm -hmm. they, they have a marketplace. Okay, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a marketplace. There are dozens of them. Right. So, for instance, there's different categories of product, and each one of those is different because... That is a marketplace because the different people sell into a specific category, right. but very few sell to all. Um, there is also a B2B marketplace because when they do order fulfillment, the level of detail that they carry about the order, so they know who supplied something, who's it's selling to, and a whole raft of other things besides size, shape, all that kind of stuff. So there are multiples of marketplaces that they control. And uh, I mean, that's the reason why Jeff Bezos is a billionaire and I'm not. <laughs> OK, so I think it's been a fascinating conversation starting from the GDPR is flawed. There are too many things which are not practically possible. Then into the deletion dilemma and how do you create or manage websites? and then the cookies and so on. But if I may ask, because in essence of time, we have to end it. And if I may ask, what would be your one final message for audiences? Um, I've been thinking about this and I would like to mention one thing. Um, and it's to do with the current health situation to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I'm all for the medics getting as much data and information as they can to, to alleviate the situation. There's no question of that. Right. Um, but what I'd ask people to consider is this. Uh, in the UK, at least, there are two companies that sell the, mo the bulk of mobile phones who are in the likely to take the lead on this. Mm -hmm. Whether or not, in principle, what should happen is for as long as the current emergency lasts, this system should be allowed to run. And when, it's, uh, when the situation stops, it should be got rid of, in principle. Yeah. However, what for a long time now, what the uh, majors have been looking to do is to perfect and test a platform for which they can do universal tracking. Right. It makes sense. And what is going to happen as a result of COVID is that governments will pay for the testing and tuning of that platform. And once it's got, once the government use is gone, it is a response. It's it's a considerable risk to the privacy of everyone. Yeah. That that capability will still be there at least conceptually. And what that means is there is massive, massive change, and I rather suspect that uh, the law, such as it stands, will have to change to cope with it. I also suspect that class action will be the main driver and not necessarily the DPAs. Right. I think we don't know how things will evolve, but these are interesting times. Yeah. Things would change. The world will not remain the same. But uh, yes, if things are to be done, they have to be done balancing out the ethical, legal, health, societal and economical dimensions. Everything yep. together, not one or the other. The, the text now are given. It's there. Yeah, yeah. That's likely to be there. We don't know in the short term, in the medium term, or even in the long term. I mean, the usage would maybe will be in short term, but the technology and the means would stay in the long term. So yep. that's where the responsibility comes along. Yeah. And with that, I think I would say thanks, Alan, for being here. 
it was a pleasure to have you. It's probably the longest conversation I had on this show. So, <laughs> but very useful, very technical, very detailed. So, thanks for your time, and it was a pleasure having you. And and you, it's nice to come along and have a chat. My missus gave me a hard time about talking too much, and I think I'd best stop. And I'm going to say this: please keep in touch. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, so this was Ellen Woods sharing his views on technology and everything. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you like this effort. Please do click like, comment and share. It is okay if you did not like it. Please still do make a comment and share with us what we can improve. If you have suggestions, ideas for guests or you want to have your question answered, please email me. My email is info at punitbhatia.com You can also share this with others and if you do so while tagging me in, I will personally thank and acknowledge your contribution in coming episodes. Thanks once more and look forward to seeing you back. Till then, stay safe, stay blessed and stay happy.